The M2 Bradley fighting vehicle, costing $1.5 million a copy, is produced by the Food Machinery Corporation, FMC. One of its champions in the Pentagon was Army Chief of Staff Edward Meyer, who since his retirement has been on FMC's board of directors. One of the Bradley's detractors was noted World War II tank commander General Bruce Clark, who said, most anything on the battlefield can blow a hole through it. And in 1977, when Hank Emerson, then an outspoken Lieutenant General and commander of the elite 18th Airborne Corps, suggested that there was much more urgently needed equipment and the Army's budget could be better spent for overall combat readiness, he was unceremoniously eased out, red-fired at the age of 52. Emerson was not the only casualty of the Bradley story, a story of a cross between a light tank and an armored personnel carrier that doesn't function even marginally well as either. The Bradley was designed to swim and can't. It was designed to carry a towy infantry squad and doesn't have the room. Its cannon tends to jam and misfeed, and just one missile or tank or RPG round could destroy the high-profile vehicle instantly, not to mention the soldiers buttoned up inside. The Bradley is a high-tech vehicle and a maintenance man's nightmare. Too big, too complicated. Gold-plated, as one serving colonel describes the R&D people's overall penchant for trying to make every item capable of doing everything, with the result that many can barely do anything well. With a long record of breakdowns and failures in many areas, including its transmission and electrical systems, and this is the same machine that the top brass of the Army vigorously maintains, with it we win, without it we'll lose the next war. It's a strange thing, how systems proved to be second or third rate are defended so vigorously, even as a matter of our nation's survival by men who should know better. Where is the moral courage of these men? Where is their concern for the lives of their soldiers? Probably in about the same place as that of the Pentagon Joker who in 1968 told me to stop fighting the M16 rifle and start buying stock in Colt Industries instead. Another monumental mistake for the Army, which, not unlike the other services, seems all too often all too ready to sacrifice the true readiness of its force rather than have a precious project, worthless or not, taken away, was the Sergeant York Division Air Defense Devedi system, designed to replace the Vulcan AD system of the 60s. This high-priority program was undertaken in the late 70s to quickly field a mobile all-weather air defense system that could maneuver and fight alongside the brand-new Bradley and Abrams, while simultaneously providing air defense over the battle area. Almost $2 billion later, Secretary of Defense Caspar Weinberger canceled the program amidst allegations of military ineptitude, rigged tests, watered down or sanitized test results, inflated costs, and conflicts of interest, after the system, 80 of which had already been fielded at a cost of $6.8 million a copy, failed to live up to even the most modest expectations. On the rare occasions when all the bug-ridden subsystems of the Sergeant York worked correctly, the system itself still could not hit an aircraft flying an evasive course or kill a missile-carrying helicopter standing off at a range of more than four kilometers. Meanwhile, the Abrams and the Bradley are now without an adequate air defense system, and will remain so until well into the 1990s, and the only heads that have rolled or careers that have suffered in the wake of it all have been those of men who screamed all along that the Sergeant York was no good. It is not insignificant to note that among the personnel who either worked directly for Ford Aerospace, the Sergeant York's principal defense contractor, or were highly paid consultants on this air defense system, were four retired lieutenant generals, two who were former deputy CGs of the Army's Weapons Procurement Branch, one who had been the deputy chief of staff for research and development when the initial request for the Sergeant York was made, and one who'd been the CG of the Army's Air Defense Center, then Director of Plans and Policy for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. In addition to these men, there was a platoon of recently retired colonels and other officers who'd worked on the Sergeant York while on active duty, only to go to work for Ford on the same project immediately after leaving the Army. It is worthy of mention, too, that at this writing retired General Don Starry, also a big backer of the M1 Abrams who, with Chief of Staff Meyer, was a major architect of the new battle concept for the European theater, which then required a new generation of hardware to include the Abrams, Bradley, and Sergeant York, is working at Ford Aerospace as well as a vice president. This incestuous relationship between the military and industry has got to stop. 
While these ex-military guys go on making deals and personal fortunes, and the procurement of defense contracts goes on being an end in itself, the United States remains fundamentally underdefended. It cannot be denied that the politicians have quite a bit to answer for in this area, too. The defense contractors will go to bed with anyone, and individual politicians have found them no less seductive than military men on the verge of retirement, especially when the contractors pay for the privilege in the form of campaign contributions and jobs in home states. But even as it cleans up its own act, Congress must also pass a law forbidding any retired military man of field grade or above, or any former top Pentagon civilian, to go anywhere near the defense industry as a second career or as a paid consultant or lobbyist. And if that proves impossible to achieve, then another law should be passed instead, allowing retired military men to do whatever they damn well please. But if they should take a job in any defense-related industry, they would no longer be entitled to their service pensions. Given that greed is a prime motivator for many people, I truly believe such a law would substantially cut down the numbers of ex-military personnel racing for the defense jobs. Without a pension, a guy would have to work for a living again, rather than just throw his weight and ribbons around. He could get fired, just as normal people are, and not be able to shrug that it was all a game anyway, and retire to his home until some other defense contractor comes along to buy his influence. While it is at it, Congress might finally and forever heed a call that's been made for decades to unify the armed services as the Canadian government did so successfully some years ago. The unification would result in, among many things, all services sharing in the fruits of successful military research and development, as dictated by the strategic interests of the country. The historical scramble among the services for their share of the defense dollar would be over, preventing the duplication among them in force structure, armament, R&D, command and control, and logistics that has allowed America's defense budget to blow out and set the country on the road to bankruptcy. The Marine Corps and Army must be merged into one ground service, though each would retain its heritage and traditions, i.e., once it is be the Wolfhounds. And while the air arm of this unified service would still be very strong to provide lift, air defense, bombers, and tack air, the naval arm would be greatly reduced from the recent, much-talked-about pie-in-the-sky figure of 600 ships. The point is, America's force structure must be tailored for the year 2000 and beyond. It must be tailored for the country's strategic needs, not based on political consideration or whims or on the dreams and schemes of Buck Rogers' designers. No longer can the tail wag the dog as it has for altogether too long in America, with weapons dictating strategy when our country's strategic requirements demand the reverse. The self-serving services today would be dragged kicking and screaming into a structure like that being proposed, and the military-industrial complex would be apoplectic, but for the first time in a long, long time, the nation would be well served. But that is still the future. In the Army today, the problem of self-serving soldiers who go through the revolving door into the defense industry could also be addressed from within by beginning to whittle away at the tremendously bloated senior officer corps from whom the military-industrial complex presently gets its uniformed and ex-uniformed membership. Today's Army, with an active duty strength of fewer than 800,000, has comparatively more generals than George Catlett Marshall had in 1945 when the U.S. Army's troop strength was 8 million. And even as the Pentagon has recently gone cap in hand to Congress to request another 363 generals and admirals to run today's military, the Army's share would be an extra 78 flag officers, totaling 393. It isn't beyond reason to suggest that in the Army at least, a lot of people have been underworked and a lot of others oversupervised in the years since 1981, when general officer slots were frozen at 315. Just two examples are the Corps headquarters in Japan, which has no maneuver units yet boasts a three-star CG and staff, and the Armored Corps collecting dust at Fort Hood, Texas, designed to augment NATO forces in Europe when the balloon goes up, but which will never be used because the U.S. military is incapable logistically of getting it where it would have to go in any timely fashion. As of this writing, a RIF program is ongoing in the U.S. Army. But let us just hope that while the dead wood is being cleared away, the budding warriors within aren't snipped off the vine. It was with great concern that I recently read a statement from Brigadier General Roy Flint, academic dean of West Point, that, you don't find officers making major now, 
much less Colonel, without advanced education and blue-chip credentials. And yet the question remains, as it has since the days of Maxwell D. Taylor when all this sheepskin hysteria began. Why? In at least one respect, the eight years of the Reagan administration bore a striking resemblance to the Eisenhower years of the late 50s. The Huge Budget Strategic Defense Star Wars Initiative, SDI, is just a logical progression in the Cold War mania that accompanied Sputnik and egged on the Soviet-U.S. missile race. In both the 50s and the 80s, the military's fascination with Buck Rogers' wonder gear was very detrimental to the human forces far more likely to be employed. At the same time, the first term of the Reagan administration had an early 60s feel about it, too. The president seemed determined to get a war going, and the military stood poised, chomping at the bit for the order to move. All in the name of democracy. The public outcry that accompanied the early 80s U.S. posturing in Central America suggested that the American people had learned from Vietnam even if those in power had not. Many could see that in Nicaragua and El Salvador, we were heading down another street without joy, about to get caught all over again trying to cure the symptoms and not the disease. Many wondered whether the administration's passionate hatred of communism was blinding it to the legitimate concerns of some truly oppressed people. Concerns that historically have pushed societies into the communist camp, such as hunger and poverty, health, education, employment, and justice for all. It is all part of America's ingrained Cold War policy, severely warped in the 41 years since George Catlett Marshall declared in a speech at Harvard, Our policy is directed not against any country or doctrine, but against hunger, poverty, despotism, and chaos. To permit the emergence of political and social conditions, in which free institutions exist, of fighting communism for the sake of fighting communism wherever the red flag waves around the world. Militarily speaking, that is an extremely vague objective, which can do nothing but leave our armed services floundering. Besides, as George Kennan, one of the authors of America's containment policy, which started the whole thing off, has reappraised his position. The lessons of Vietnam are few and plain, not to be hypnotized by the word communism, and not to mess in other people's civil wars where there's no substantial American strategic interest at stake. Of course, unlike Vietnam, Latin America is of substantial strategic interest to the United States. But the U.S. has made its job of keeping the area within the Western sphere of influence harder every day through its insane policy of economically and militarily supporting repressive regimes with leaders like Somoza, Pinochet, or Duvalier. Regimes that are or were as bad if not worse than the worst found among the Soviet satellite countries or the USSR itself, simply because the dictators or crooks at the top have thrown their hats in with the U.S. against the Soviet bloc. Historically, this attitude has backfired on the U.S. Recent history shows us Diem in Vietnam, the Shah in Iran, Marcos in the Philippines, to name a few. When the people finally cried, Enough! After all, it was American policy that sent Castro into the Soviet camp. American policy is what has turned Central America into killing field. American policy has allowed that gangster Noriega to poison our children with his drugs on our streets. Ernest Hemingway warned of these sad times in his introduction to Men at War in 1942, We must win it, World War II, never forgetting what we are fighting for, in order that while we are fighting fascism, we do not slip into the ideas and ideals of fascism, but his message has gone unheeded in succeeding U.S. administrations which on top of all else have allowed the CIA to run riot in third world nations with excesses that rival the Nazis in their heyday. So developing a humane, empathetic ear for the real problems of our neighbors is a primary goal if the United States truly wants to make Latin America a friend and strategic ally. But another factor must also be considered and dealt with, and that is Castro's Cuba. Cuba is for the revolutionary nations and people of Latin America, what China was for the North Koreans in the Korean War, and what Laos and Cambodia were for the Vietnam War, sanctuaries for our enemies and supply depots for their cause. Yet as David S. Nez, deputy to U.S. Ambassador to South Vietnam Henry Cabot Lodge, wrote so succinctly to his boss in 1964, one of the two basic lessons which the past 20 years of communist conquest through wars of national liberation have taught us is that a communist insurgency having access to an active sanctuary has always prevailed. 
the insurgencies in Greece, the Philippines, and Malaya were defeated because there was no active sanctuary, or because they were deprived of the sanctuary. It is time the United States actively takes issue with Cuba's role as supply middleman for the Soviets in providing equipment to communist regimes and insurgents in Latin America. Only when the sanctuary is deprived them is there even a remote possibility that the insurgents' arms will be laid down for good. How to do it? If solely diplomatic means don't work, a naval and air blockade would. The Soviets aren't going to fight in Cuba so far from their shores and so close to ours. And militarily, it is America's only chance of getting on top of a situation otherwise deteriorating day by day. And yet, almost 14 years after the fall of Saigon, a young serving brigadier general explained to me that in today's army, the problem is not the systems being unable to recognize the lessons of the past. That, he assured, it can do. Instead, he said, the army's problem is its inability to extrapolate from these lessons so they can be judiciously applied in the future. Despite the continued heavy emphasis on armor and potential war in Europe, he went on, and being prepared to fight that war is the crux of deterrence, he said, and in principle I agree. He was encouraged by the Army's move toward the establishment of light infantry divisions to deal with smaller or unconventional conflicts as well. So am I. But what the Army and the military overall must never forget as it surveys the world's trouble spots and plans for and dreams of its next moment of glory is that neither it nor the country it serves can ever afford, in Central or Latin America, in the Middle East or anywhere, another only war we've got. That too is one of the legacies of Vietnam. For years there was a popular belief that the Vietnam War destroyed the U.S. Army, but it didn't. Our Vietnam experience simply cut away the facade and exposed a cancer-riddled interior. Now, the Army has fought back from the edge it teetered on in the early 70s when dope raged through the new, all-volunteer force, and disillusionment led to the resignations of many of the young regulars, the Pat Graveses, the Jim Mukoyamas, the Ed Clarks, who were among the best of the Army's future. But it still has a long way to go when an Army professionalism study in 1984 yielded almost identical results to a similar study conducted in 1970, which pinpointed faked reports, shoddy leadership, and self-promotion as responsible for eroding the basic values of the Army of the day. Degdeg. The 1984 study actually gave senior officers even lower marks for competence and looking out for their subordinates than had the report of 14 years before and half the officers questioned said that the bold, original, creative officer cannot survive in today's Army. The 1984 study concluded that the officer corps is focused on personal gain rather than selflessness, and while this well mirrors what is happening in the world outside the military, it cannot foster and sustain high morale within. Meanwhile, in 1988, as the Marine Corps under Commandant General Alfred M. Gray and the Air Force under Chief of Staff Larry D. Welch publicly announced a campaign to rid themselves of ticket punchers and the ticket punching mentality, the Army still maintains that it solved this problem way back in the 70s. As Army Chief of Staff Wono explained, we hold our officers to standards of selfless service and bedrock integrity. They must then compete within our officer evaluation, promotion, and assignment systems, which are designed to reinforce these concepts and advance those who best meet these standards. The theory is great. But the problem remains. The standards of selfless service and bedrock integrity are set by the men at the top, and if the men at the top are careerists, they will make room only for their ilk among those coming up through the officer ranks. Besides recalling an officer of the caliber of Fred Wyand, Hal Moore, or Hank Emerson to be chief of staff in these times when change is possible, Army policy should require a retired heroic soldier of the likes of Jim Gavin or Jim Hollingsworth to be president of all flag rank promotions boards, to ensure that the ticket punchers, not the warriors, are the ones weeded out in the selection process. The Army must insist that its leaders be taught how to think from the moment they step on the first rung of the leadership ladder. They should be encouraged to become students of war with independent histories, biographies, and autobiographies of men such as Montgomery, Ridgway, Patton, and Rommel made required reading. Combat now and in the future will require leaders who are able to act independently and who are not afraid of taking risks. A knowledge of history and the ability to think and synthesize 
are the tools a warrior needs to confidently weigh up the odds while working out the best course of action. The Army's current system of up and out must be abandoned. Not every man can be a general, nor does he want to be, and there is no reason why a good man cannot skipper a rifle company at the age of 45 or HFTI, First Sergeant Walter Sabolowski, who provided veteran NCO leadership in Bill Carpenter's company during the Battle of Dak II in 1966, was 56 years old at the time. The Army needs a flexible personnel system that concentrates on the man, not the computer printout. And it is time the Army seriously consider adopting the British system, which has a major commanding at the company level. Meanwhile, the draft should be reintroduced to return the Army to a citizen's army and to make every American aware and prepared to pay the price of admission to life in a land of freedom. At a savings of literally billions of dollars, a draft would also ensure well-educated, high-caliber troops, not unlike the draftee whiz kids who appeared in force in the late HFTI's post-Sputnik missile age, to understand and operate the high-tech, complicated gear the 80s Army had saddled itself with. The Army must look deeply into itself and make incisive reforms, to include, for example, establishing an inspector general specifically for training. The imperative for this is that as nuclear weapons are phased down and, I hope, less and less regarded as a viable means of waging war, the Army must be strong enough to pick up any chips that may fall. A truly well-trained, truly well-led Army is essential now, as never before. It should be added here that the Intermediate Nuclear Force INF Treaty is a giant step back from the nuclear abyss, but it is still only a first step. The destruction of Iran Air's commercial 747 by the U.S. cruiser Vincennes during the Gulf conflict well illustrates the potential for human error among anxious, overtired personnel in stressful situations and is a somber reminder of the need for the superpowers to drastically cut back perhaps by 90% their strategic missile arsenals to vastly reduce the risk of an accidental triggering of global nuclear war. The United States must look deeply into itself, too, to see what we as a nation have become. It seems to me that the values that would make someone a patriot, the values that compelled me to join the Army and to believe that I had a vital role to play in the preservation of those values, have been bled out of America. The Cold War mantle of the free world's policemen, which, if not really a fact, was at least widely accepted as one for many, many years, though perhaps once a great source of pride to our nation, has proved to be a wellspring of arrogance, not unreasonably making us disliked, even among many of our friends around the globe, and perhaps even sowing the seeds that have made greed the major growth industry in our land of opportunity. The last eight years have seen America strutting its stuff on the world stage and spending its citizens' hard-earned wages on billions and billions of dollars' worth of military hardware that can never be used. Meanwhile, its industries have closed down in big numbers, many of its families have gone homeless and its children unfed, and we have become the biggest debtor nation in the world. The United States must shape up. It is a great country with a great heritage. It has set a good example in the past, and it can do so in the future, if only it begins to choose its battles carefully and make sure its causes are right. It is time to reduce the military machine that has broken the back of the nation's economy and begin to rebuild the industrial plant that made us great. While Americans shrink at the thought of the lost war in Vietnam, they forget that even now Japan is celebrating a belated wartime victory. Without the constant drain of resources into wasteful military projects, there is no reason that the United States could not be competitive with, perhaps even outshine, its erstwhile foe and at the same time maintain the very finest military force, one from whom impossible efforts would be demanded and to whom all sorts of tricks would be taught. That's the kind of army in which I should like to fight. Forty years ago, when Captain Eggleston told 18-year-old me that I would one day make a great contribution to my country, I didn't know what he meant. Maybe he didn't either. Maybe he just recognized a boy who believed and good leader that he was wanted to give me something to aspire to. Whatever his reasoning, I know it worked. If I left the army in America with anger in my heart, it was no doubt in large part, because I did feel I'd given both my all, including speaking out when too many others were silent, an act not all that far removed from the one of the little boy in Italy who told General Eisenhower he didn't think we should have to eat spam every day. Maybe that was my contribution. In any event, all these years later, the anger is gone, 
and in its place is the belief that I still have a contribution left to make.